Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service that comes to you after a rather stormy week. A week of wind and rain. And when we're all feeling perhaps a little buffeted and looking forward to the end of winter and the coming of spring. We begin our worship with a prayer. God, you have created us out of your love and for your love. Christ, you have redeemed us by your love and for your love. Holy Spirit, you inspire us with your love and for your love. Give us grace to perceive your love and to reflect on your love. Holy God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. You give us love. You give us life. You give us yourself. Help us to give our lives, our love, and ourselves to you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, we have our first hymn. It's not only the storms of weather that we encounter in our lives, but the storms and tempests of emotion, of relationship, of work. Times when we are upset, confused, blown about by events around us. Times when perhaps we fail to rely on God and fail to do his will. So let us come back to him in humility and in repentance. We come to you, Lord, for you alone can heal and restore us. We are not able to heal ourselves. We are not able to forgive ourselves. We are not able to restore ourselves. We are not able to sanctify ourselves. We are not able to satisfy ourselves. 
We come to you, Lord, for you alone can make us heal and make us whole. May God, our Almighty Father, bless us, keep us, and restore us in his image and in his love. Amen. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for, no, uh, for, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. The Gospel reading is taken from Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. In recent times, we've become accustomed to the succession of named winter storms, tracking across the North Atlantic and crashing into our shores, bringing with them danger and disruption, with wind gusts in excess of 100 miles an hour. And there seems to be little doubt that the increasing frequency and ferocity of these storms is linked in some way to man-made climate change. Earlier in the year, we welcomed Arwen, Barra and Corrie to our shores. And in the past days, we've become familiar with the destructive power of Dudley and Eunice. 
It's as though by giving everyday names to these storms, we can in some way control them or make them appear less threatening. But that, of course, is nonsense. And when we witness the power of the massive waves breaking on our western shores and the devastation of noble trees brought down by the strong winds, we realise that the forces of nature are something way beyond our control. The North Atlantic is renowned for its violent storms and treacherous conditions. But in my mind's eye, when I picture the Sea of Galilee, I imagine something completely different, something calm, inviting and benign. As a relatively small inland body of water, you might imagine that it would be protected from the worst of the winds by the surrounding hills. But apparently that is not the case. Because of the topography of the land around the lake, the wind can be channelled between the hills, creating strong gusts over the surface of the water. And in high winds, the lake can get rough very quickly. Large waves can swamp cars left unsuspectingly on what might have looked like safe beaches. And the small fishing boats used on the lake can be tossed around like children's toys. So when we hear Luke's description of the storm, there's no reason to doubt how violent this was. Remember too that at least four of the disciples, Andrew, Peter, James and John, were fishermen by trade and would have been used to the conditions on the lake. For them to have been so frightened, fearful of being drowned, it must have been unusually rough. Israel had no claim to be a seafaring nation. From earliest times, the sea was regarded as being something other, something malevolent. It came to symbolise the dark power of evil, threatening to destroy God's good creation. When Luke's readers pictures his account of the storm, their minds would have heard echoes from their ancient scriptures. Back to the stories of creation, where God's new order emerged from the primal sea. Back to the stories of Jonah or Daniel, to the fearsome Leviathan referred to by the prophet Isaiah. The sea had a power that only God could control. In the book of Job, when the Lord spoke out of the storm, he asked, Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, This far may you come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. Or in the Psalms, like Psalm 107, which immediately makes us think of that day on Galilee. Some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. In our own time, we still have that fascination with the sea, a mixture of attraction and suspicion that makes us look on from a distance as mighty waves, driven on by the wind, crash against our rocky shores and coastal defences. We stand amazed at this primal force, that even with modern knowledge and technology simply cannot be controlled or placated. And when we witness that power, we can well understand the fear that those early disciples felt. But then we have Jesus. Exhausted from a day's preaching and teaching, he lies in the stern of the boat fast asleep, with his head on a pillow. Despite the howling of the wind and the crashing of the waves all around him, threatening to overwhelm the boat, he remains undisturbed. Until, that is, the frantic disciples wake him. Master, master, we're going to drown. And of course Jesus responds, 
First he deals with the storm. He rebukes the wind and the waves, and immediately the wind dies down. The sea becomes calm. Then he turns his attention to the disciples and asks them, Where is your faith? And the disciples, still terrified and now bewildered, ask each other, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. What is not entirely clear is whether the disciples are now terrified because of the ordeal they've just been through, or because of the demonstration of divine power that Jesus has used to calm the storm. Or perhaps it's both. One thing is for sure. Standing on dry land and hearing Jesus telling oblique stories about the coming kingdom felt relatively safe. Witnessing Jesus overcoming the raw power of the natural world was something else. This was more than they'd bargained for. And I wonder if we are the same. We like to be able to debate theories about God and what his kingdom might be like. We like to be able to analyse Jesus' parables and find multiple layers of hidden meaning. But faced with the raw power of God, we too can feel more than a little uncomfortable. When Jesus questions the disciples about their lack of faith, what he's really saying to them is this. I may well have kept you faith by stilling the storm, but you've been with me all this time. You've heard my teachings and seen the things that I've done. Whether I stilled this storm or not, surely you should have known that I would still take care of you. Throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus does not want to reveal himself as Messiah through his miracles, but through his teaching. Because if you only look at his miracles without understanding the greater depth of his teaching, then you'll misunderstand the Gospel and misunderstand Jesus himself. All of his teachings point towards the cross, and if you remove that from the way that you look at Jesus and focus only on his miracles then you risk up ending with some sort of cosmic magician and not a saviour. When Jesus rebukes the disciples for their lack of faith, it's not their lack of faith in believing that he can do miracles, but their lack of faith in being able to see that the kingdom of God was hidden within Jesus, in the same way that a mustard seed, with all its potential for growth, is hidden in the soil. They should have known that Storm or no storm, God was in Jesus, and they were safe in the boat with him. If all the disciples could take from this example of Jesus' power was that he was able to subdue the elements, then Jesus knew that when the chips were down, when he was facing his own death on the cross, they would have expected him to perform another miraculous escape rather than following his true path. Through our lives, we will all experience storms and troubles of one kind or another. As followers of Jesus, we're not promised any sort of exemption. In all of Jesus' miraculous acts, he never promised that he would intervene in the same way for each one of us. Quite the opposite. He frequently told his disciples that they should expect trouble, persecution and hardship. But in and through it all, we're to remember that the kingdom of God is within us. And with Jesus in the boat, whether or not any particular storm is quelled, we will never ultimately be swamped.
Let us pray. God of creation, you have given us a beautiful garden in which to thrive and flourish. Awaken our senses to the glory of its rich diversity. You graciously provide us with every good thing to sustain life. Water to drink, food to eat, the sun to give light and warmth, and the clouds to bring shade. Rain to make seeds grow, land and oceans for us to explore, and animals for us to care for. You have given us to each other, that we might live interdependently in companionship and community as partners of equal value. And you made us to live in conscious union and loving relationship with you. Thank you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of life, when we forget you and try to live proudly and independently of you, and when we forget your guidelines for helping us to live well together, restore us to a proper understanding. Sometimes human relationships become strained. Family ties may break down through poverty, poor health or painful loss. They may become damaged by betrayal and abandonment or addiction, abuse and violence. These and all kinds of discrimination distort your divine image within us, denying the dignity and value you bestow upon each of us. Protect and heal your wounded ones, broken by grief and suffering in our communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of judgment, even the wind and the raging waves obey your command. Hidden about some of the institutions of our country, malevolence stalks. Root out and expose that which needs to be banished. Cleanse the sickening culture of racism and misogyny in our police force. Protect, support and encourage its members who want to do the right thing. Call each of us to account when we evade responsibility in our own spheres of influence or work. Calm the storms and threats swirling around the Ukraine and other places of potential or actual conflict. Lift the oppressive forces bearing down on places of religious persecution so that all your people are free to worship and honour you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of heaven and earth, we give thanks for your church. Saint John, in his vision of heaven, saw a door standing open, and beyond it, the throne of God. Keep your church doors open as an invitation to all to come and meet the risen Lord, so that all may feel welcomed especially those who don't yet know you or who've been hurt in the past by bad religion. Keep the eyes of our hearts fixed on you, our God of justice, who looks on us with compassion, the one who walks alongside, the one who points the way and the one who calms the storm. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And finally, drawing all our prayers together, as Jesus taught us, we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
we come to the end of our worship time together we ask for God's blessing and God's peace on us as we venture out into the world and into another unknown week full perhaps of blessings but also of, cha also of challenges may we know God's peace Jesus is the Prince of Peace the one who stilled the storm the Lord Jesus Christ, who stilled the waves and calmed the storm, uplift you 
and uphold you in his peace. The peace of Almighty God, the Creator, be yours. The peace of Christ, the Prince of Peace, be yours. The peace of the Holy Spirit, the Sustainer of all, be yours. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you and all those whom you love today and until the ages of ages. Amen. So thank you for joining us today, and I do hope that you will have, indeed, a blessed week, and that you will be able to join us again next Sunday. Goodbye.